All right. We got one. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and call this uh, regular board meeting to order. Uh, we will first off start with a roll call, and then we'll move to land recognition. Kevin Altucker. Here. Denise Diamond. I think she's on her way. So, yeah, we'll we'll get that. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Mike Eister. Here. Austin Fulnagy. Here. Lisa Fragala. Here. Steve Mattel. Here. Zach Mulholland. Here. Shailen Bays here. Excellent. And Denise will be joining us here shortly. So, and we'll notate that when, when there's an arrival. Uh, next is going to be the land recognition. Um, and we have Ashleen Bays uh, to uh, read the land recognition. Thank you. I'd like to start the meeting with the acknowledgement that the land we are on is the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people. The Kalapuya people were stewards of this very land for over 14,000 years before their traditional way of life was forever disreputed. We start our meeting with humility and reverence for the original inhabitants, the Kalapuya. Thank you so much. Next is adoption of the agenda. I'll need a motion and a second for the adoption. So move. Second. Excellent. It's been moved and seconded. And uh, we'll do a roll call vote for the adoption of the agenda. Kevin Altucker. Aye. Denise Diamond. Mike Eister. Aye. Austin Fulnagy. Aye. Lisa Fragala. Aye. Steve Mattel. Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aye. Zach Mulholland. Aye. Perfect. Uh, uh, the agenda has been adopted. And uh, next, we want to take a quick moment here to uh, recognize, uh, on, on behalf of the board here, we want to recognize the Lane Community College women's basketball team uh, and discuss just their recent win at the Northwest uh, uh, Athletic Conference uh, title win for the second year in a row. And uh, I believe uh, Greg, is he here to, oh, okay. Well, uh, regardless, we want to just simply uh, recognize uh, the women's basketball team for their um, extraordinary record and um, their second win in a row here. Absolutely, an absolute applause. Uh, President Bolger, was there anything else you wanted to state on that? Fantastic. Um, again, we want to thank our students, athletes for their commitment, not only to um, to their academics, but also uh, to their athleticism and in in, into the sport. So thank you. We have responses to information requests. Uh, is there any comments, questions um, or additional information out of the information requests? Oh, Mike? Yeah, um, I think I had asked about um, scheduling uh, an agenda topic for the retreat and the response was that the president and the vice president are going to talk about that, but I didn't get an answer to the question. Oh, well, oh, I I apologize. I thought we forwarded the um, email in regards to when we were last discussing it, that it was going to be an agenda. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we sent you the meeting minutes of that discussion that the board had, and the discussion was to bring it to the retreat. So, Great. Yeah. Thanks. All right. All right. So, all right. And if anything else in regards to information requests? All right, we'll move on to public comment. Um, I believe there was nine uh, people uh, signed up total uh, with an additional online. Okay, fantastic. Oh, let's let the minutes uh, show that Denise, uh, fellow board member, has arrived. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I would say let's keep it to three minutes uh, for the public comment. The um, the board will not be responding uh, to any statements made during board comment. I uh, will not directly uh, uh, talk about any issues raised during that public comment time period, but we will refer those issues to the president for appropriate action. Um, I also want to just state that it, it's really uh, there's a desire to applaud people as they uh, you know after they speak in public comment. If we can instead just to keep decorum and keep the process moving, uh, just uh, applaud with uh, ASL style uh, just to uh, continue the process. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with our first um, public comment. Kendra Rivera, followed by Anna Gates Tapia. Greetings. Did you know that 20 to 25% of college students nationwide identify as neurodivergent? Neurodivergence refers to people whose brains work differently than neurotypical brains. 
Usually, the neurodivergent parts means that neurodivergent people, like myself, process information differently. We often have different responses to sensory information or stimulation, and sometimes we communicate in ways that may seem different to a normal person. I am neurodivergent. I am also the faculty member in the Department of Communication and the faculty advisor for the Neurodivergent Student Union at LCC. Neurodivergent people face a variety of challenges, some of which are related to our neuroprocessing, but we also face stigma and ableism. According to a news report from CNBC, the unemployment rate for neurodivergent individuals in the U.S. is as high as 30 to 40 percent, compared to only 10 percent for disabled persons at large and um, only 3.7 percent nationally. This fact is a reflection of the student success rate in college as well, with large equity gaps between neurotypical and neurodivergent students. According to US news and reports, and listed in almost all recommendations for improving college success for neurodivergent students, one of the things that they recommend to that, that students do is join a student organization, preferably one that supports their unique strengths and needs. The Neurodivergent Student Union at Lane's Community College was established in spring 2023, and we have been meeting together and doing really well and doing lots of things like teaching workshops and um, hel helping other people learn about neurodivergence, too, for the last year. Last night, we learned that the Student Fees Committee voted to fund our newest student union at LCC at only 50% of what was requested. This funding also re represents being funded at only 40% of what the other student unions are receiving. The Neurodivergent Student Union is considering appealing this decision, but appealing is complicated for neurodivergent people. In fact, the entire process of trying to become a student union has been very challenging. But I need to tell you about one of the founders and co-leaders of our Neurodivergent Student Union. Her name is Beth. After sleepless nights preparing for our budget presentation, when Beth learned of the decision, she experienced the first autistic meltdown, as she described it, as she has said that she has had in over three years. She, today, she attended school and experienced mutism, which means that she literally lost her words. She had to put a sign on herself explaining why she couldn't respond to anyone who talked to her. Um, Beth wanted to come tonight, but I told her to stay home and take care of herself and recover because we might have a long fight ahead. <laughs> you will be voting at the May 1st meeting on student fees. I encourage you to learn more about neurodivergence in the month you have ahead of you. Um, if you are interested, you can feel free to contact me, Kendra Rivera. I have, you can look at me in the Lane Community College. I'm happy to provide you with more information, research, student testimonials. Yeah. Um, students have already started handing me their essays, telling me how much important the neurodivergent student union is for them. And we need funding for that. And so I hope that you will consider that. Maybe the student council fee will also um, consider that as well. Um, but I, I hope that you'll learn more about neurodivergence and, and find out more about what our club um, and hopefully our student union um, will be doing. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next speaker. Next speaker. Oh, perfect. Good evening, esteemed Board of Education, Dr. Bolger, and all present here tonight. As the Dean of the College and Career Foundations Division, I stand before you with immense pride and gratitude to shine a spotlight on the outstanding work of the staff and faculty of the Adult Basic and Secondary Education, ABSE, and, ES and English as a Second Language ESL departments. My name is Anna Gates Tapia, and I'd like to begin painting a picture of the impact of adult education. According to the Coalition of Adult Basic Education, adult education provides numeracy, literacy, English language skills, digital literacy, work readiness, soft skills, high school equivalency, and numerous wraparound services to more than 1.5 million adult learners nationwide. Here in Oregon, we're fortunate to champion this cause at the community college level. With recent reforms, recognizing its significance through enhanced funding allocation for services to ABSE and ESL students. The new funding formula also recognizes that historically, communities of color are, and marginalized people have been disproportionately impacted by budget cuts that reduce resources at all levels of educational institutions. 
The funding formula reform aims to reverse this trend by increasing funding to institutions who serve greater numbers of underrepresented racial and ethnic students. At LCC, the Adult Basic and Secondary Education and English as a Second Language departments stand at the forefront, serving a diverse tapestry of over 1,000 individuals, including over 15% 15, 15 of the college's Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, and Native American students. These departments are not just about developing skills. They are about empowering dreams and unlocking potential. And behind these statistics lie our dedicated ABSE and ESL teams. Each member, whether staff or faculty, embodies excellence with a wealth of expertise and a passion for transforming lives. Their impact transcends our campus, resonating across the state and nation through contributions to workshops and conferences, elevating both our students and the reputation of our college. Tonight, I'd like to extend my gratitude to each of you for your support of our ABSE and ESL students and the dedication of the LCC employees who serve them. Let's continue together, united in our commitment to expanding opportunities and nurturing success for all those who walk through our doors. Thank you. Thank you. Shamar Clark, followed by Tammy Maz and Paula Thani. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shamra Clark, and I manage cooperative education internships for about 16 different programs on campus. In alphabetical order, automotive tech, aviation maintenance, coaching, construction tech, culinary, diesel tech, drafting, engineering, general work experience, flight tech, manufacturing tech, occupational skills, pharmacy tech, phlebotomy, unmanned aircraft systems, and welding. I also teach a directed elective career prep course for drafting, health information management, sustainability coordinator, and pre-apprenticeship students. We learn things like, ne like networking, professionalism, cover letter writing, resume writing, interviewing, and emotional intelligence. In particular, empathy and vulnerability. Shout out to Brene Brown. In my seminar course, we work on converting regular interview question answers into behavioral-based interview question answers simply by incorporating examples and the elements of dynamic storytelling. I do one-hour mock interviews with each student, which can result in a student going from tears, short answers, and imposter syndrome to expressing themselves with confidence by giving skill and strength-based examples that demonstrate who they are and what they can do. They usually tell me how much better they feel about interviewing after our coaching session, like they now understand the purpose of an interview, and it's not meant to be tricky or painful, but that, that it can be a positive and connective experience. I also do one-on-one -on -one resume meetings with each student. Now to some co-op stories. I send students to their first professional position for which they have been studying for. Here are some highlights from my areas of co-op. Uh, the University of Oregon has become an amazing opportunity for, for both construction tech and culinary students. I had two construction students there this past winter term who got to drive around in golf carts with iPads on a team of experienced engineers, HVAC techs, plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. They were exposed to every area of repair and maintenance on the campus, not to mention learning a software system to track all of the ongoing projects and professional communication with staff, faculty, and students on the campus. One reported a sense of belonging to a team that truly cared about safety. He had never felt that before in previous jobs. I sent two phlebotomy students uh, to co-ops um, at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital and also Peace Health Sacred Heart Medical Center, Riverbend. Each received full-time positions after their co-ops. One reported gaining confidence in working with court mandated, mandated draws, knuckle draws, and wiggly children draws. <laughs> The students are the, the, the reason that I'm here. They're the heart of co-op. In addition, one of the most rewarding aspects of my job is connecting with employers in our local community. Not only has my position allowed me to peer behind the scenes of so many industries, like think airplanes, CNC machines, big diesel engines, bakeries, hospitals. It's also allowed me to meet ahead, new interesting experiences. Oh, thanks, sorry. No worries. 
In five years, I've developed sites that will respond and heed the call when I'm in need of finding a co-op for a student. They recognize the beauty of mentoring our workforce and that in industry and LCC can work together in gratitude. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Trying to stand to the side. Oh, uh, un unfortunately, yeah, the mic, yeah. Okay. Thank, well, thank anyway, you. I'm Tammy. Um, my name's Tammy Maz, and I've worked here as part-time faculty in the dental hygiene program for almost 30 years. Um, I've also worked as temporary contracted faculty for four of those years, and I've also worked half-time in a dental office for over 30 years. The LCC Dental Clinic has been around for 50 plus years and has survived several adverse events, including having to relocate in the middle of a school year in 2013 due to building four having sick building issues, getting our students through the program very creatively with travel and long hours. The LCC Dental Hygiene Program was relocated to a temporary permanent location on Willamette Street, which was supposed to be a five year lease and now it's been over 10 years. We underwent a major remodel during COVID in 2000 that creates additional challenges to teaching and treating dental patients in this small space. We are grateful that we are moving back to a home base on campus in the new health professions building in fall of 2024. Tonight, I would like to address the issue regarding the 0.682 TLCs for one contact hour with students in a lab setting. Our students complete their lecture courses in an online or hybrid mode. Some dental hygiene program lab classes take place on campus in a sim lab, and then clinical patient-based lab classes take place off campus in the dental clinic on Willamette Street. As you are aware, faculty are compensated less for their work in lab classes than for lecture. One hour of lecture class counts as one teaching learning credit, or TLC, but an hour of lab class counts as only 0.682 TLCs. Doug Young in chemistry spoke to this issue at a previous board meeting in December. The inequity of lecture versus lab compensation has been an ongoing issue and topic of discussion for the dental hygiene program for almost 20 years. This is a significant workload issue in dental hygiene because as faculty, not only do we supervise and assist groups of students as they learn the technical skills necessary for the career, we are also responsible for safe patient care. These clinic lab session times involve active learning where we are responsible for preparation, fielding student questions, giving advice, and active observation of all aspects of direct patient care. Dental hygiene students see a variety and diverse group of patients of all ages. We are not only treating people's dental needs, we also manage patients with complex medical conditions and other special needs. Daily skill activities for students include administering local anesthesia, nitrous oxide sedation, using complex medical grade equipment, treating complex oral conditions and recognizing conditions such as oral cancer, undiagnosed hypertension, diabetes, and other indications of a medical condition that needs attention. You want to finish it? <laughs> I'll finish uh, Tammy's statement. A typical six hour lab clinic work session usually consists of arriving at least one to two hours early. On a typical day, I am in the clinic ab at about 11 a.m. and most times walk the out the door well after 6 p.m. with no breaks in between. There is essentially no difference in the amount of work between a lecture course and a lab course. In fact, lab courses are more work because of the additional time it takes to prepare, treat patients, debrief, and do paperwork and grading yet we are only compensated at about two-thirds the rate of a lecture course. Considering awarding one TLC per one hour of contact for both lecture and lab would more accurately represent actual workloads and aid in retention and recruitment of faculty. I feel it shows respect for the work of career and technical education programs at LCC as we continue to grow. Moving into a new dental clinic next fall shows that the college supports and believes the work that we do. Having this remuneration for lab courses be more accurately represented for the work we do will continue to support and invest in a sustainable and worthwhile health profession. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Melissa Kilgore and Anna Kilgore, followed by Eric Kim. Good evening. 
Thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns regarding, regarding mental health resources available to students on campus. On Monday, I met with a student who was in tears as they disclosed their medical issues, disabilities, and being kicked out of their home by their mom a few days before the term started. They are now houseless. Pre-COVID, I could walk students down the hall to a mental health counselor in the science and math building. Now, I have to trust that my student, who is in crisis, will follow through with my recommendations to call or go to the wellness center and speak to someone. LCC is fortunate to have a mental health and wellness center that students can access. They have three full-time licensed faculty and three interns working towards licensure. They offer support groups, workshops, and in-person and Zoom counseling for students. Their staff and counselors have to juggle, have a lot to juggle. With limited appointment times and such a small staff, students often have to wait a, meet, a week to meet with someone. In addition to scheduled appointments, students in a mental health crisis arrive at the center and staff scramble to ensure the student receives the best possible care, even if it means being pulled out of lunch. The center can see seven to 10 crises a week with up to three in a single day. And those are only the students that find their way to the center to receive help. As faculty here for over 16 years, I have seen an increase in student mental health struggles. Rand Health reported nearly 50% of college students experienced at least one mental health concern prior to the beginning of COVID. In spring 2022, the American College Health Association surveyed over 54,000 undergraduate students and reported that 77% experienced either moderate or severe psychological distress with 30% exhibiting suicidal behavior. We know that community colleges play a critical role in supporting students who come from diverse ethnic and economic backgrounds. Our students usually have additional responsibilities with jobs and family commitments, increasing their stress and anxiety. The American Psychiatric Association reported in 2021 that community college students have high rates have higher rates of mental health challenges when compared to students attending a four-year institution. Because of financial constraints, community colleges and their students tend to have access to fewer mental health resources than universities. Knowing that we have a higher proportion of students in need, yet fewer resources available for their students, it is critical the students have easy access to services to increase their success in college. And I'm gonna let Anna Kilgore, my daughter, who is a, an LCC student here, finish. Okay. We have to put a lot of time and energy into retention of students and encouraging them to register for classes. Students need more than academic support. Students who aren't able to access mental health support have higher dropout rates. The Healthy Minds Network determined through their multi-year study that mental health and access to those services are strong predictors in retention. According to NAMI, yeah. NAMI of those students that dropped out of college, 64% cited that they quit because of mental health issues. There's a strong connection between retention, academic success, and mental health. Hiring additional full-time faculty into mental health counseling positions and having them in high need areas on campus versus one location should be a priority. This would increase student retention by providing adequate mental health support for our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Good evening, Lane Community College Board of Education and Dr. Bolger. My name's Eric Kim. I teach psychology in the social science division. I'm here to talk about what students learn in psychology and the social sciences. Many people believe that doing multiple tasks at the same time, or multitasking, increases productivity and efficiency. The science of psychology finds the opposite. We are less efficient when multitasking. This belief persists because we don't get feedback on how long it takes to do two tasks at the same time and when we multitask. To illustrate the difficulties of multitasking, I would like you to mentally recite the letters A through J to yourself as fast as you can. Most of you can quickly do that. Next, mentally count one to 10 to yourself as fast as, as fast as you can. And most of you could quickly do that. You're doing these two tasks one at a time or in series. 
To simulate multitasking, mentally interweave these two tasks you just did as fast as you can. What I mean by this is A1, B2, C3, and go all the way to J10. It is difficult. Distractions such as me talking makes it even a little bit more difficult. And if you get interrupted while you're doing these two tasks, it's difficult to continue where you left off. This demonstration is to show the limits of thinking, not to make you feel bad about yourself. People have a difficult time multitasking. Psychologist Stephen Chu has students compare the time it takes them to do a serial task to the time it takes them to do the interweaving task to see how much slower multitasking takes. I encourage my students to do one task at a time instead of trying to do two tasks at once. When you compare heavy media multitaskers to low media multitaskers, they have difficulties distinguishing between relevant and irrelevant information, detecting subtle cues and details, elaborating on their learning, and they have more errors in working memory. Some examples of multitasking and their problems are the increased uh, risk of running a red light while you're driving and talking on your cell phone, mixing up macro and microeconomics on a test when surfing the internet and studying, Errors in ringing up a customer or giving the wrong closing hours if you're running the cash register and answering the phone. Or missing details about your mother's cancer treatment or subtle the furrowing of the brow as, you wa as you're watching the Super Bowl and talking to your brother about the treatment. I would also predict that heavy multitaskers have poor social relationships and are less likely to notice emergencies. That's a topic for another day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Last week. Jen Zacklin. Right. Still no one on. Okay. Perfect. Don't want to hit the microphone here. All good. Good evening. My name is Jen Zacklin, and I am a faculty member in Career Pathways and English as a Second Language, or ESL. And thank you, Anna, for your kind words for my colleagues and I and everyone who works in our department. Um, and I'm also a classified staff member in Career Pathways. In my free time, I like to write textbooks. I've written four books so far, three of which have interactive Moodle or online components. Uh, the books are not copyrighted, so anyone can use them, edit them, or adapt them for their classes, which makes them open educational resources or OERs. They're all completely free and can be accessed as Google Docs or PDFs, and two of the books are also available on a print-on-demand website. And here's one of them. Students end up paying about $14 to print this book with $0 in author revenue. Um, I used to print it at our printing and graphics so that I could give it to students for free, but since our MS budget is very tight, I can't do that anymore. Many faculty, not just me, in the ESL department have been working diligently to adopt, adapt, or create more OERs that are free or inexpensive to print instead of having students buy commercial textbooks that usually cost our students around $30 per term. And as a side plug, if ESL students can't afford their books, we have a textbook scholarship fund that was generously started by Diane Doubt, who taught at Lane for 13 years. Diane passed away and left a large amount of her estate to the ESL department for student needs. But because student needs are great, the textbook scholarship fund is dwindling, and we are always grateful for more donations. Uh, back to OERs. OERs save students collectively a huge amount of money. One example, a handful of Lane ESL faculty and I collaborated on a project in 2018 for an OER for an ESL class here at LCC. And according to Amy Hoffer, the Open Oregon Statewide Open Education Program Director, six instructors across the state report using that OER that we created. And so far, because they use those free materials instead of buying textbooks, students in Oregon have saved over $17,000 from just that one project alone. Maggie Wright is the OER librarian here at LCC, and she shared that OER and low-cost classes are saving LCC students well over a million dollars each year compared to average textbook costs. OERs and low-cost materials directly contribute to our institutional goal of increasing enrollment. A nationwide study through Achieving the Dream showed that students who are enrolled in OER courses earn significantly more credits than students enrolled in courses without OERs, and a study through Open Oregon Educational Resources looking at Oregon public colleges and universities showed that class sections that were designated low cost or no cost filled with students at a significantly higher percentage than sections without that designation. 
So OERs help with college affordability and they help with enrollment. My ask for you today is, as a board, please keep in mind funding support for faculty for adopting, adapting, and creating OERs. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. And that's it for public comment. Appreciate everyone who uh, participated. Next is going to be the president's report. Dr. Balder. Yes, thank you. On Monday, April 1st, our spring quarter commenced after a rejuvenating week-long spring break. I am thrilled to report that early indications are that the enrollment numbers are continuing to rise for the sixth straight quarter compared to last year. Enrollment is up by 10.2%, full-time equivalent is, has increased by 10.4%, and headcount grew by 8.1%. While not qualifying as, a, as an Hispanic Serving Institution, or HSI, LCC was one of 412 emerging Hispanic Serving Institutions, noted in an analysis by Excelencia in Education at 16.6% of full-time equivalent in 2022-23. Our college culture is rich and multifaceted. One distinctive feature that defines us is our unwavering commitment to sustainability. It permeates every aspect of our institution. I am excited to share that I will be presenting alongside Jennifer Hayward and Richard Glover, LCC faculty, at the upcoming American Association of Community Colleges Conference. Our focus will be on the Innovative Learning Garden Initiative, a project funded by our students. This initiative not only addresses skills development, but also tackles food insecurity and fosters community partnerships. Last month, I had the privilege of hosting a faculty of color meet and greet. Both part-time and full-time faculty members came together for a meaningful lunch. This gathering allowed us to share experiences and strengthen our sense of community. In closing, I want to again recognize the Titans women's basketball team who won the Northwest Athletic Conference for the second straight year and seventh time overall. We could not be more proud of their accomplishment and the season that both the women and men's basketball teams had. I am deeply honored to work alongside each of you. Together, we continue to shape the future of Lane Community College, guided by our shared vision and unwavering commitment to excellence. And that's my report. Thank you. Next is the Student Government Association report. President. Good evening. I am pleased to report this on behalf of the current Senate of the Lane Community College's Government Association. Our Senate consists of the following esteemed members, myself, Nicole Solis, and Senators 1 through 7, Josue Bivegue, Lisa Claudio, Kate Qualiso, Marie Monyang, Nora, sorry, not Nora, <laughs> Kyle Solomon, Aman, and we have a new member, Sophie Gibson. Our spring term is off to an exciting start with several upcoming events. The first would be our balanced meal event, scheduled for April 15th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the second floor of the, Senate, of the center building. This event, directed by Mrs. Tamberly Powell, will educate students on nutritious dietary choices and will also feature exciting prizes, including blenders and other meal preparation items. Next, we have the Did You Know Bingo. It's on the 8th of April, which is Monday, uh, Monday coming up, uh, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. This will also be on the second floor in Central Building. This incentivized game provides insights into the college and serves as a fun pastime activity. Prizes such as squishmallows and gift cards will be up for grabs. <laughs> Another upcoming event we are looking forward to is a safety demonstration. The date is yet to be finalized, but we are hoping to schedule it very soon. The purpose of the event is to provide students with self-defense training and promote vigilance and importance for safety and empowerment of our student body. We will also be providing snacks. <laughs> we are proud to announce that our CARE project initiative has been approved unanimous, unanimously by our Senate for a $10,000 grant to support housing initi initiatives. This significant contribution demonstrates our commitment to addressing the housing needs of our students. The funds will be utilized to provide direct housing assistance and resources, further enhancing the support system for our students in need. Furthermore, we are delighted to have helped by making a small donation to students, such as Wade Fisher, to attend a film festival in Portugal called Filmapalooza at Li Lisbon. We believe in investing in our students' talents and fostering their growth outside of the classroom. 
Their success at the festival is a testament to our belief in their abilities and their potential. In response to rising tuition costs, the SGA has given the green light to the Student Activity Fees Committee to reduce our cut of the student activity fee by 10%. This decision underlines our commitment to our students, ensuring that the overall student activity fee does not increase for individual students. I would like to mention that the election committee for the upcoming student government, the committee composed by, of myself, Senator Lisa and Senator Gate, is actively seeking strong, determined students. We are looking for individuals who are willing to put their personal interests aside at times to make sound decisions that will benefit our institution and our students. There's also University Day coming up, which our Senate is interested in. It's a camp campus-wide beautification event where students, staff, faculty, and community members gather to beautify and participate in small projects on campus, which is at U of O. It will be May 16th from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. We continue to work diligently for the betterment of our student body, and we deeply appreciate your unwavering support. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the reports. Moving on to the consent agenda. Is there any items that uh, would like to be removed for discussion? Seeing none, if I can have a motion um, for the consent agenda. I'll motion to approve. Okay, motion. Second. Motion and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Nope, not for me. All right. Um, I'm actually rather, uh, we'll do a roll call for this one though. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Kevin Altucker. Aye. Denise Diamond. Aye. Mike Eister. Aye. Austin Fulnagy. Aye. Lisa Fragala. Aye. Steve Mattel. Aye. Zach Mulholland. Aye. Excellent. Just like that, we got through a pretty significant part of our agenda. Um, next is going to be the budget committee appointment. And, um, Let's see, we have a recommendation. Um, and uh, Lisa, since this is your uh, committee appointment, would you like to speak on it? Sure. Um, for people who may not be aware, the previous appointee um, that I had appointed, uh, Kajanda Love, needed to um, move back to um, Illinois for some personal reasons. So she had to step down from the budget committee. I'm very excited to uh, um, recommend for appointment tonight. Um, Larissa Ennis. Um, she has a strong record of governance and budget management and has served two terms on the University of Oregon's Officers of Administration, the OA Council. Um, she served as the board of directors for the Oregon Mozart Players from 2015 to 2023, including four years during the pandemic and immediately following um, when they were experiencing pretty significant financial challenges. Um, she's had 15 years as a program administrator and community affairs professional at the U of O and has monitored department finances and the institutional budget. And she's also an appointed commissioner on the Homes for Good board since 2020. So I'm excited to recommend her for an appointment to our budget committee. Excellent. And I'm confident that she'll be able to get up to speed as we enter the budget cycle very soon. Absolutely. Uh, we'll go, I'll go ahead and accept that as a motion. Is there a second to that? Excellent. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll just, uh, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Seeing none, uh, the budget committee appointment uh, for the at-large committee appointee, rather, uh, position uh, has passed. We'll move on to discussion items. Uh, first uh, item on the discussion is the audit presentation. Uh, Dr. Bulger. Yes, we're pleased to uh, present the uh, uh, the audit for this uh, for this last uh, year. And but I want to first uh, introduce Kara Flath, who's our new vice president of finance and operations. Kara, if you'll just wave to everybody. <laughs> um, but but for this evening, we're going to have John Nisbet actually introduce the auditors. John. I know many of you have had an opportunity to meet our auditors uh, from years prior, but I'd like to reintroduce Karen Bourne and uh, Kenneth Coons from Kenneth Coons and Company in Salem, Oregon. Ellen. Thank you, John. 
Members of the board, Dr. Bulger, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to discuss the results of the audit. And what we'd like to do tonight is just provide a brief overview of the results of the audit and also answer any questions that members may have uh, stemming from, from the report. I think I'll start by just uh, going through just a brief timeline of how the, the field work went and then how how the, the process went to develop the, the report that leads to these financial statements. So the, the work on the audit really begins in the summer and through conversations with uh, management and staff at College Finance that went on throughout the summer and fall, uh, it, it became clear through those conversations that College Finance would like to have a little bit of additional time to uh, prepare the records and to make all of the, the, the final the final adjustments that would be needed to before the audit could really commence. So at their at their request, we we decided to seek an extension request from the Oregon Secretary of State's office that would allow some additional time beyond the normal December 31st uh, deadline for having the audit filed with them. Based on the, the the staffing turnover at the college and other challenges over the last couple of years, we were confident that there would be no issues with getting an extension. So that request was made and it was it was approved. And so that granted an additional three months to complete the work. Beginning uh, right after the first of the year was the, the point in time when the, the records were uh, substantially ready for the audit. And most of the work that we did took place uh, during the month of January. Um, most of the work was done remotely. We, uh, we were given access to the banner system from, uh, from offsite. And the college also established a, a shared drive, a way of exchanging files and other documentation for us to review in a, in a secure fashion. We were provided with all of the access that we needed and all of the assistance that we needed to complete the audit procedures that we needed to do and ultimately express an opinion on the financial statements. Uh, part of this even included uh, weekly Zoom meetings uh, during the, the early and, and middle stages of the audit uh, that, that was really quite helpful in kind of keeping everybody up to speed on, on how the audit was progressing and, and different information requests that, that were out there. But again, I I just want to emphasize that all of all of our questions were answered, and and we received all the assistance that we needed throughout the course of of the audit. I'd like to point out too that uh, compared to the audit that we performed at one year prior, uh, we noted that significant progress had been made in in terms of assembling the documentation and and really keeping some of the underlying underlying records in place. So we just wanted to make that known as well. So what is the purpose of an audit? The, the, the records and the, all of the financial information is the responsibility of the staff and management here at the college. And the purpose of the audit is for someone outside of the organization to come in, to look at that information, test it, and to ultimately determine whether the financial statements are fairly presented. So that, that was really what, what the audit was about. Um, there's a few different reports that we issue as, as part of the process, but the, the main one on the financial statements is, is called our independent auditors report. And on that report, we have issued what's known as an unmodified opinion. And that is an, op an opinion without modifications that might refer to uh, issues in the report. An unmodified opinion could also be thought of and is often referred to as a clean opinion on the financial statements. So that is the report that we issued on the financial statements themselves. In addition to the financial statements themselves, because of the significant amount of federal financial programs that the college receives, uh, it is also required to undergo some special audit work specifically targeted on larger federal programs. The biggest one of which that the college has from one year to the next are the federal financial aid programs. Over the last three or four years, there's been another very large program uh, that was associated with the CARES Act and COVID-19 assistance money that was, was coming to the college. 
through that audit, this we've had to audit the CARES Act money each of the years that it's been around. That was uh, really a requirement from the Department of Education, who deemed those programs to be uh, a higher risk program that, that needed to be examined each year through the course of the audit. It had actually been a few years since we had needed to test the financial aid programs, but this year it was back back in the rotation. So we uh, performed a pretty extensive work with the folks at the financial aid office to, to perform our work on that. So the results of our testing over internal control and compliance with the federal programs, uh, we have no exceptions to report on, on those areas as well. And then the third report that we issue is one that is specifically required by the state of Oregon, and it they ask us to look at the college's compliance with certain uh, statutes and and laws within the state of Oregon, such as uh, budgeting, uh, budgeting laws, public contracting, bidding laws, and where you're investing your uh, surplus funds. Um, in that report, uh, we do note some budget over expenditures, which are really not too uncommon. Uh, I think they had to do with the grant grant fund, not not the general fund. But we did report a few uh, over expenditures in there. But those were the only uh, findings that we had in in any of the three reports that we issued. Outside of the reports, uh, there you may also have seen another separate letter that the firm issues to the members of the governing body. Mm -hmm. The purpose of that letter is just to cover some items that are required uh, by the auditing standards for an auditor to communicate. Uh, it just says things such as management did not try to influence us while we were doing our work that, like I said earlier, we were provided with all the assistance that we needed. Um, it draws attention to some larger estimates that are contained in the financial statements, things of that nature. Uh, but that that letter is again fairly fairly routine. Uh, at this time, I'd be happy to answer questions that the any questions the board may have on the audit or the financial statements. Any questions, Mike? Um, you mentioned overspending. I assume that if we spent too much money out of one pocket, we had some money in another pocket to backfill that or? The one that comes to mind was, I think it was in the special revenue fund, which is the fund that accounts for most of the grant activities at the college. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes grants will will uh, will come in mid-year when after the original budget has been adopted. So it's uh, more of a cash flow issue then? No, it wasn't a cash flow issue, no. Uh, it, uh, it was just a case of the uh expenditures exceeding the latest budget appropriation for for last fiscal year another way that can happen too is uh, uh expenditures or uh, adjustments that are made after june 30th when it's not no longer possible to go back and do a supplemental budget um those types of things can happen i don't it wasn't an issue of the grant being overspent just the the budget appropriation authority thanks all right any further questions oh sorry denise Thank you. Um, just following up about that grant, I did notice the um, comments uh, about that, which seemed to be that uh, I'm not aware of how many grant writers we have at the college, but it seems that that's an area for us um, to look at. Heard that noted. Mm -hmm. We have we have uh, decreased revenue, right in the category of grants. Yeah. Would that Heard be accurate? That. Oh, is that is is that an accurate statement? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, grant programs come and go uh, from one year to the next. One of the big grant programs that the college has had over the last couple of years, again, was that CARES Act money, uh, which which was several million dollars over the last uh, two or three years. But the major uh, programs included in that uh, in that program wrapped up uh, early in the, the fiscal year 22-23 year. So you, so the the financial statements that you're looking at here, the 2023 year includes just really a partial year compared to what you had seen the year before for for the CARES Act, for the CARES Act money. 
And I just, um, if it, it, does someone else have a question, I can wait because I, I just had another uh, follow up. Uh, you can go ahead with follow up. Okay. I was just curious. Um, I was noting that you did, uh, that there is a reporting of about um, 10 years. Um, I'm looking at page 85, the number of contracted employees. Um, and I was just wondering if the report also um, identifies numbers um, for management. Is that part of, of the reporting? The information on page 85 is part of what's referred to as the statistical section. And all mm -hmm. of this information uh, is prepared uh, by, by, the, by the college staff. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily audit the number of classified employees shown on the schedule, or we don't really do audited procedures on the statistical information. Uh, our, our report covers mainly the financial statements at the front and the other supplementary information, but not the statistical section itself. So I wouldn't be able to, to comment on the statistical section page. Okay, it's because it just would seem that, um, of course, all employees um, participate in the other uh, financial sections that you do report on, which, of course, are pensions and health care. And so um, with this report going over the course of about 10 years, showing increases and decreases, um, I was just wondering that correlation. Okay. Might need so, to follow up with you. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if you'd be able to answer that. We might need to follow up uh, with a potential answer to that question. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm also looking to the cabinet to see if there's any potential answers. Probably not at this time. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm looking on page 20. The uh, heading is analysis of Lane Community College's statement of net position comparing FY22 with FY23. Uh, there was a fairly significant decrease in the net position. I'm wondering if you could kind of give us the uh, the elevator highlights of that. Absolutely, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, there, there's a couple of big, big stories here. Uh, one of them is that the information in this table, uh, that there's a, a, a timing difference with the money that's received from the state of Oregon for community college support. Uh, that would, oh, okay, it's on the third line called state community college support. Yeah. The the funding cycle and the payment stream from the state follows a pattern of three payments in odd numbered years and five payments in even numbered years. So that's why you see a $15 million decrease. Mm -hmm. That's because you there, there were really approximately five, uh, $7 million payments the year before and only three in, in 2023. So that's, that's the biggest chunk. Um, the, the decrease in grants is, is again, primarily the uh, wrapping up of the CARES Act programs. Yeah. And that's that, that's really the biggest biggest yeah. driver here of the drop in yeah. that Thank position. You. Yeah, it's known as the eight quarter problem. We, that's part of the reason why, like when the walkout happened, there was a possibility we wouldn't get the eight quarter payment, which would have been huge. And uh, I know there's Discussion um, of how we can change that and how we fund higher education. Um, we'll find out more in this next legislative session what that looks like. So. Thank you. Oh, Shane? Yeah, I just have an answer to um, Denise's question. On that page, the column that lists them as exempt, that's referring to the management group. So they're just titled something different on that page. Uh, Steve? Yeah, excuse me. Question for you. The... Uh, uh, as you know, right, we have this uh, $120 million um, bond, right, that uh, that we received. Communities paid for that. Lots of activity in the last, uh, significantly front-loaded, lots of activity in the front years. Do you um, audit that? Does your work sort of look at that um, or separate that out in any kind of way from the rest of our 
uh, kind of regular activities so that we could potentially report back to the community that we've all that we you know have had that independently reviewed and not that we would expect any problems, but that we could just simply report back that that's also been independently reviewed. Uh, I, I I did notice there was a lot of construction activity just through all the invoices that that we were looking at over the over the course of the of the audit. Um, we did not do uh, anything specifically as as far as issuing any specific report related to the bond activities, but the uh, enormous amount of of different projects that were going on and invoices being paid uh, that certainly uh, was felt through the audit. We did look at a lot of maybe even most of the monthly invoices from the major contractors as part of the audit. Just a follow-up. So let's just say as a board, we decided we wanted to have that in the future, you know, bucketed in some way so that we could, instead of seeing all of that kind of, uh, you know, baked throughout the process where it would be hard for us to tease out precisely if there was a problem, where might it have been located, but instead to have you look at that as a, oh, as its own kind of organizational unit, if we, if we, if we were to request that, is that the kind of thing that you could do? Um, it's possible that we could do uh, some agreed upon procedures work. I could say that uh, it is tracked It is tracked separately within the college's financial reporting system. Within the capital projects fund, there are uh, different, different sub funds that track the activities for for different building projects that are going on so so that that information is is currently uh, readily available from the financial reporting system yeah just as a comment uh, for anybody out listening, I don't have any reason whatsoever to think that there's an issue. So that's not just so everybody's clear. That's not why I'm asking, but I can imagine that the community might, you know, appreciate that independent view. So that's why I'm asking whether we're in the position to do something like that. Yeah. I, I also haven't served on the bond oversight committee. I also feel like that is a great, you know, governing body that helps with keep making sure. I mean, it's sole purpose and it's charter is to make sure that we are spending the money the way we promised that we would. So, yeah. Absolutely. But no, I appreciate what you had to say there. Any other further questions or comments about the audit? Overall, um, I saw that there was a lot of positives in the audit altogether with the institution as a whole. Um, I also, there was obviously some hiccups in, in, in certain situations, of course, but I do, do felt like there was a overall positive uh, feel for the, the financial status of our institution as a whole. So thank you for that. And it was uh, incredible details. I really appreciated uh, the work that went into it. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you for the uh, opportunity to present to the board today. It's our pleasure. Any final questions, comments? All right. I'll venture one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I've been on a another board um, that, you know, same kind of process. So I have some familiarity with it. In addition to the sort of the detailed 120 page type reports uh, that um, you would issue, that organizations, auditing organizations would issue, we would also get, you know, something much shorter, five, seven page kind of uh, executive high level um, uh, letter. And uh, at least I don't think I quite saw quite the, the, the type of thing that I would have liked to see um, with the uh, you know, executive level detail. Maybe I missed something. It looks that by look on your face, it suggests perhaps I, I did. But I, I would like to see something in between. You know, the the two page welcome and the hundred and twenty page. You know, here's everything. Are you referring to the like the financial information? Because uh, the management's discussion and analysis does. Uh, it's more than two pages, but it it does uh, boil down the information in the financial statements into a, a more digestible form. And it does provide analysis provided by management for some of the, uh, the reasons, explanations for some of the changes from one year to the next. Uh, that, that is toward the front in, of the report, mm -hmm. at least in the bound copies, it starts on, on page five. Mm -hmm. But that that is a, a really good read to get kind of a thumbnail view of the activities of the organization for the year. For, and that's that's a element that you'll find in the audit reports of any governmental or municipal entity. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. With that, thank you again for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Moving on to academic affairs update. Uh, Dr. Walsh, Dr. Yes, we have two updates with academic affairs and then following that, student affairs as well. Perfect. 
Good evening, board members and President Bulger. Um, as Bo President Bulger uh, said, we um, just started the spring term two days ago. It was absolutely beautiful outside, and we're all anticipating summer. From the academic affairs perspective, the spring term begins and then it's over. It's a very quick term. Um, we are going to be celebrating uh, the accomplishments of our students throughout this term, and we have commencement on June 15th, and it's going to be here before you know it. Um, for me, it is the most wonderful time of the year. I do um, enjoy commencement season. I wanted to provide you with a few highlights from my report today, and I will keep it very brief. Um, I met with our business department um, just this afternoon, and in my report, um, you'll notice that our enrollment for our very first baccalaureate program is, is quite good. Um, we had um, anticipated 20 students in our very first cohort. We have 35 and we have a wait list of 14. This is a testament to the very hard work that our business faculty, what they're doing. They are marketing this themselves. They are engaging in that admissions process. And we have a very strong cohort to begin our, um, our adventure into baccalaureate level education. Just to give you a few highlights of that group. Um, one third of the uh, students coming in are our alumni. So we're serving our own students. Um, two thirds of those students are first generation college students. So we are reaching into non-traditional populations and providing them a business education that they probably couldn't get anywhere else. And we're giving that, that applied focus as well. And um, so yes, I, I couldn't be happier about that. And also some other good news, we think we're going to do two cohorts per year. So where we thought we would have had 40, we will have 70. So again, this is uh, exceeding our expectations. The other thing I wanna to report tonight, and just, just a little bit, I mentioned uh, just a bit in my report, what we're doing around artificial intelligence. And today I was meeting um, with some colleagues, uh, you know, outside the state, and they really commended um, our presidential task force on AI, because unlike other institutions, I mean, everyone's reacting to this, mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to transform it's going to transform education and it has the potential to be disruptive, but also has a potential to provide opportunity. What makes Lane unique is that we have a structure to have the discussions. And um, I serve as co-chair. Um, Kevin Steves is the other co-chair. Um, Kevin's doing fabulous work engaging with the faculty, and we will be presenting to you, um, I believe, at the June board meeting. We're very excited to share our work with you. Excellent. Any questions? Okay, Mike. So, uh, Shelley, I can still remember the enthusiasm and energy of the faculty, the business faculty, and mm -hmm. I have very little question that um, that enthusiasm and energy is translating into the enrollment that we're talking about. And yeah. it also um, points to the wisdom of developing the program uh, and the need for it. Absolutely. Great job. Thank you. And thank you. Great job to the faculty. Yeah, absolutely. They did this work before I got here. But um, I'm glad to to benefit from that. If they're doing fabulous work, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and great marketing on that too. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to uh, the uh, student affairs update. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I lots of different things happening. Uh, spring is um, is is one of those times where we you know fall is huge fall is king but spring it's overdrive we're we're just non-stop i wanted to call out different departments uh mainly in what we're doing tonight um uh, mental health and wellness are doing a series of workshops this spring for students meditation group executive functioning skills group intimate insight group cross-culture care collective group wellness warriors process and support group and trauma recovery and empowerment group um, we, um, our enrollment services team is still working on, um, we got 577 spring term fraudulent applications. Uh, so I'll to give you an idea of how, how big that still is. Uh, the community colleges are pulling together again and, and having further discussion on what's happening where and how we might be able to help prevent it as quick as we try. They change their methods. and. And so I think we're going to probably talk about um, more in-depth ways of doing that. 
I'm, I'm just going to say again, our uh, women's basketball uh, team, fantastic. And also, um, I've got a, Greg Sheely, won the coach of the year. And so um, we couldn't do better. I wanted to mention uh, Monday and Tuesday, we had welcome week. It was much nicer than the one in winter where it was raining sideways the whole time and people like huddled under tents. Um, this time it was gorgeous, 70 degrees. Uh, people listened to music. Shaylin was dancing. Uh, <laughs> um, but we had administrators, students, we had classified staff, faculty all out there volunteering all day, both days, walking students to classrooms, giving them coffee, giving them advice, everything wonderful. Um, I got to say thanks to Carl Ye um, and Megan for kind of doing the lion's share of organizing it. And, and of course, Becca back here. Um, Regfest the week before that, the, the weekend of before spring break there, uh, we had a team in building one missions, financial aid, enrollment services, the Bursar's office advising and others. Um, and it was just a terrible nonstop rain day and we're still helping students left and right. It was a little quieter because it was spring break. Um, I also got to say yesterday, wonderful event in the center building, second floor, pizza with the presidents, Dr. Bulger and Shailen Bays. Uh, we're there to meet all of our students, have pizza, have a chat, get on TikTok. It was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Uh, um, last week, we uh, welcomed um, some new um, international students for spring coming from Saudi Arabia, Togo, Sweden, Taiwan, Myanmar, Japan, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And then yesterday, we had a team from Oregon State University uh, on, on campus, uh, Kristen Benson, one of my uh, um, best uh, long-term colleagues, um, used to be a PCC, is, is doing great things out there at OSU, and they came to talk about the core curriculum change, helping us understand what it means to our students who are going to be transferring and how better to advise them to meet the needs of their degree uh, programs when they transfer to OSU. Um, Thursday, April the 11th, um, the Child and Family Center is going to take the daycare children out on a parade around campus <laughs> for the week of the young child. And I'll tell you, seeing the kids strolling around campus is prop. I, I just rush for the doors when I see it. Um, uh, Dr. Tinkham here, myself, yesterday there was a group going around on a scavenger hunt. We helped them find birds, brown leaves, twigs. No look on the ladybirds. Ladybugs. Um, we had no luck on that, uh, but but we were helping them, and it was just a blast. Um, we hired two new people. Uh, Laura Lacasa in financial aid uh, came from 13 years at uh, U of O, and she's a banner expert, and we need that. Uh, and then Jody Parrish is an early learning coach, and she comes from ECC Cares, um, which is a co-op with the University of Oregon. Um, and I think that might be it for me. Excellent. Happy for questions. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, just a comment. So the kid parade sounds really cool. <laughs> uh, and I think Cheryl Henderson might have had something to do with that, maybe, yes. perhaps. Absolutely. Uh, Cheryl's a longtime colleague, and uh, so that's really great to hear. Yep. April 11th. So this Thursday, I'll try and find out what time it's happening and, and let people know. And yeah, because it is it's it is great when you say it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in regards to welcome week, I mean, um, I, I mean, uh, I just want to thank the classified professionals, the faculty for going out. I mean, what makes um, a community college institution welcoming is to be welcomed, right? Yeah. And to be out there and to welcome people and to exactly, I love those. <laughs> I love seeing them every time I see them. Uh, the ask me stickers and so forth. Um, and it's really amazing. And that's what truly allows us to like welcome people from all communities, all walks of life uh, to our institution. So I want to thank everyone who's been a part of that. Well, we got to welcome and we got to keep them. It's retention. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you once again for those discussion items. We'll move on to the um, to the reports, uh, the LCCA report. Good 
Good evening, President Bulger and members of the board. Um, I'll give a brief report on three topics. The first one is related to highlighting needs for faculty from historically oppressed groups. Uh, the second is related to labor relations. And then the last is a brief update on LCCEA activities. Um, as you are likely aware, we had a separation incentive and 15 full-time faculty members elected to retire or resign as a part of that separation uh, incentive. Um, there was a disproportionate number of faculty separating who are from historically oppressed groups. They comprise 26.7% of the faculty retiring or, sep uh, or separating, uh, excuse me, retiring or resigning, while 16.3% of the full-time faculty at large. Um, some of the data from our uh, most recent all faculty survey um, provide some context for this disproportionate number of faculty members who are choosing to separate 80% of faculty respondents in our survey, which had 248 faculty participants, indicate that addressing bias and discrimination on campus is a high or highest priority. 76% indicate that ensuring that hiring practices promote diverse employee pools is a high or highest priority. 71% uh, rate promoting retention of faculty from historically oppressed groups as a high or highest priority, and 69% indicate that adopting a restorative justice model and dealing with bias and discrimination on campus is also uh, considered a uh, high or highest priority. This is a function that was previously done by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. These data underscore the need for reinstatement of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and board leadership on this issue. Within a national landscape where 38 states, including Oregon, have considered legislation that would ban DEI efforts and or limit curriculum and restrict academic freedom, your leadership is more important than ever. Um, a request regarding labor relations. We reported in July about legal fees and college expenditures on outside attorneys. According to information provided by the administration in response to a public information request in fiscal year 21, that's the 2021 year, the college spent slightly less than $20,000 on outside attorneys uh, for counsel on faculty labor issues, then $107,000 in FY22 and more than $141,000 in FY23 for a total of nearly $270,000 in three years. Um, we believe that cooperation and collaboration on professional development for managers on the collective bargaining agreement is a best practice. And we think that this is in the interest of the institution and the campus community at large. We have successfully collaborated in the past with HR and the college's former legal counsel, Mike Blade, who will be sorely missed um, in the past. However, the administration recently clarified that they are, quote, not interested, end quote, in collaborating on such professional development. We respectfully request that the board consider providing leadership to promote such collaborative efforts around professional development. Thank you kindly for your consideration. And the last topic is a brief report on LCCEA activities. Uh, we have been very, um, very engaged in a lot of collaborative efforts within the state as well as the nation uh, over the past month. Um, the OEA PAC convention took place in Eugene um, in March, and LCCEA representatives, including faculty member Wendy Simmons, who serves on the OEA PAC board, participated in a democratic endorsement process for local candidates for the Oregon legislature, statewide office, including the Secretary of State, as well as candidates for Oregon's representatives to Congress. Leaders and representatives from LCCEA met with colleagues from across the U.S. at the Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining in Higher Education in New York, with a focus on building coalitions to support academic freedom, investment in public higher education, access and equity, and promoting higher education for the public good. And um, last, we're looking forward to our uh, statewide event uh, coming up later this month. The Oregon Education Association Representative Assembly will be sending nine elected delegates uh, to this event as the largest community college local um, within OEA. Our focus is going to be to provide direction to the statewide organization, specifically promoting legislative objectives that center community college needs 
in order to galvanize the support of the 42,000 member strong organization for the benefit of our community college system in the next legislative session. And we're looking forward to working with um, all of you uh, as we approach that legislative session ne next year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is the LCC EF uh, report. Is uh, Frank, you break it right. I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna uh, just start off with um, this month, our some of our union um, leaders met with uh, Dr. Bolger and with Shane Turner, and we discussed the Florence campus with them this month. Um, when I went out to the Florence campus and what I discovered when I was out there is the Florence campus is they um, still don't have any on-site credit classes and they don't have an academic advisor. They used to have a part-time IT person that was out there. They also had a part-time CE programming person that was out there. And there's just some other things that are needed. We did have a great conversation with Dr. Bolger and with Shane about this. And we feel um, fairly confident that some of this will um, be taken care of. Otherwise, to report to you guys, since we have done the contract, we um, had the contract ratified. We are now regrouping um, our union itself. We're creating some committees. We've got our COPE committee, which we've got fewer working on so that we can restart our endorsement program, which is we've stopped a little bit this year. And so we're hoping to get that taken care of. We've got a communications committee, and we've also got a hardship fund committee that we've gotten going this year so we can do more when um, emergencies are coming up. and. Um, we have won two scholarships to send two people this year over to Chicago for labor notes. And that is pretty much where we are right now. That's our whole report. So thank you very much. I do want to thank all of you board members again from the deepest um, part of my heart. And I didn't want to write this and script this. I wanted to tell all of you guys, thank you so much for ratifying the contract. It means so much to our members. They're looking forward to um, the raise and they're looking forward to the back pay. We've had so many members um, struggling this year and it's going to really help them out. So thank you very much. We appreciate you guys. Even if you don't see it every day, it's appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure the cat there also appreciates the <laughs> Zoom time. Uh, thank you, Frankie. <laughs> um, next is uh, information reports. Uh, any questions in regards to the information reports? Okay. Let's see. Oh, uh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I did just want to comment that I, I think this may be the first time in quite a while that we've had a vice president mm -hmm. for finance and operations that did not have interim or acting in front of their title. Mm -hmm. uh, all, we've had some great experience with interim and acting uh, vice presidents, and I appreciate that, John, the, the work that you've done. But it's really nice to have uh, someone on board that's going to be the, the real person for a while. Glad you're here. Excellent. Yes, thank you and welcome. All right. Any other questions in regards to the report? What he said. What he said. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So moving on to the good of the order here. Uh, boards, comments, questions. Oh, Mike. Um, I, I'm not sure I uh, caught this correctly, but I, I thought I heard in the EA report that the administration said they don't want to collaborate. And that just, uh, I'm wondering if you have any recollection of a conversation like that or if that rings true or. Uh... No, um, I don't have a recollection of of that uh, sentiment um, being in place, but I wonder if I can um, ask Shelly to also speak to speak to that. And this is regarding collaboration with regard to training, I think it is. Right. So um, I think that comment was made in response to a conversation we had at the Labor Management Committee meeting. Um, LMC is a joint group uh, between EA and, um, and management. And our comment was that we wanted to focus on our relationship at LMC and to build that relationship and until such time, we were not interested in having a joint training with um, between HR and LCCEA. So thanks for want, that elaboration, yeah. mm -hmm. clarification. Gotcha. 
All right. Any other questions? Um, well, yeah, I, have, go ahead. I have a comment. comment. Oh, yeah. Comment. Uh, well, I'm looking at the clock, and I think we have to pump the brakes here because we're in extreme danger <laughs> of finishing before 730, which is, which is really taking the wind out of my sails on this whole going to, you know, having a discussion about one meeting per month. That's that my goal. said, <laughs> that said, I would like to have some sort of process where we can have a discussion where we weigh the pros and cons, the pluses and minus, minuses of meeting twice a month. And whether that takes place in a retreat setting or if that's a special subcommittee, an ad hoc committee that's set up, I would be interested in, in moving that uh, process or is just to explore um, the possibilities. Gotcha. Any particular like information you would want in the pros and cons or? Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in hearing from staff in terms of, you know, the twice a month uh, meetings and how that affects their workload and, and meeting deadlines. I'm interested in hearing from other board members in terms of, you know, are two meetings a month helpful uh, or, you know, could we accomplish what we need to do? with one meeting. Um, I'm just interested in learning more about the total situation. And just because I think we could do it in one meeting doesn't mean it's a good idea, but I'm interested in finding out what's what's happening. Yeah, thank you for expanding on that. Any other questions, comments? Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out was just the OCCA um, update. I wanted to make sure that you guys had a chance to uh, read that. Uh, there's some interesting things that, especially in this last uh, um, uh, legislative session, um, and uh, yeah, this is a this is a really interesting time period, um, especially with recruiting our next executive director and a variety of other different things. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, uh, I'm really uh, there's there's things I'm looking forward to in this next um, legislative session coming up in 25. There's things that I also know that we have to fight really, really hard to make sure that we actually properly fund higher education um, here in this state. And uh, there's uh, there's fights to to come. Um, I want to encourage the board to be prepared to, you know, uh, do board actions like we've done before in the past to tell our legislators that, hey, community colleges are a part of creating a not only economic success, workforce success, but also allows for us to uh, to uh, provide resources to marginalized communities to better their lives and their communities. Uh, there's just yeah, I mean, I could literally talk for hours about this, but all together, um, really looking forward to um, uh, what we have to come in the next uh, legislative session in 25. So any further comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, um, we have uh, future uh, meeting dates of April 17th. And our first uh, board um, uh, uh, board budget meeting will be on May 1st, uh, in that we will elect the next uh, uh, budget committee uh, chair and vice chair in that meeting as well. That will be one of our first actions in that. And then uh, we will um, have the um, a budget committee meeting on May 8th, as well as a work session and budget committee on May 15th. Any uh, questions about the future meeting dates? And do we have an executive session today? No. Nope. And no executive session to, Executive session today. And we are going to finish before 7.30. Is that all right, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> all right. We are adjourned. Can I mention one last thing? Sorry. Um, oh, the Bill. powwow is on Saturday at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Avery All Coyote and the NASA students have put a lot of work into it for months. Um, so please attend. If you can, it goes from 12 o'clock until 7, 8 o'clock at night. So, so Excellent. Please attend. First grand entry is at noon. Perfect. Thank you for that reminder. Yes. And there's some great uh, materials um, on the table. Thank you, everyone.